Good evening, everyone. You are watching Direct Line Live with our special guest, Kyle Furby, from the Young America's Foundation. Yeah, uh, welcome. And I'm joined by our normal host, Mark Uncafer, on Pinch Hitting for the always working Ryan Nidak, who is helping out Jessica Hare, who is going to be the next county executive in Anne Arundel County. Uh, so let's take it away, guys. Welcome to the show, Kyle. Hello, well, thank you. Well, welcome, Kyle. You know, YAF has got a long and distinguished history, and it's kind of useful to go back and explain it. It's kind of interesting because right now we're very fixated, not fixated, but we really are focused on the back and forth within the academic, within colleges and universities. And yet that was really one of the very beginnings of, of YAF going back to Sharon, Connecticut, and the Sharon Statement. You want to give us a little context there about where you guys all got started? Sure, absolutely. So uh, you mentioned it. We got our start in Sharon, Connecticut, actually at the family home of William F. Buckley under the Great Elm in 1960. So we've been around a while. And we got started up to combat really what we've been combating ever since then. And that was a growing dogma within a lot of high excuse me, institutions of higher education um, prior to YAF's founding, uh, conservative ideas weren't really in the vogue. You had a few people like Russell Kirk and uh, William F. Buckley who were helping fight that. But as far as the youth was concerned, much like today, um, the left was in control. And, and at this time, uh, the Soviet Union had really influenced, unfortunately, a lot of our educators. And there was another group called the Students for Democratic Society, which was really a communist front group. Um, that uh, started up in the 50s that had taken storm or taken campuses by fire. And um, so there were conservative students who were inspired by Buckley and uh, they were ticked off at the uh, enthusiasm growing behind SDS. And they wanted to show um, that conservative ideas are actually the ones that empower people, unite them and lift them up. Um, so they started gathered together. They wrote something called the Sharon Statement, um, which is considered the seminal document for the conservative movement. It really ignited it and brought it into reality. Um, and ever since then, it's been operating on campuses, high school and college to help push back against the growing left on campus, but also as an organization that helps educate and inspire conservatives and helps lift them up so they can better articulate their viewpoints on campus and off campus in their greater community. And then in 1969, Young America's Foundation, which today is a parent organization, was founded at Vanderbilt University. And that organization was founded to do exactly what uh, YAF is well known for today, and that was to help conservative activists bring in big name speakers and pay for honorariums. Full you know, students don't make a lot of money. Uh, they oftentimes have to spend it all on their college tuitions. Um, and so Young America's Foundation provides uh, students with that opportunity and, and resources really to help students bring those speakers in. And so in 2011, the organizations which had pretty much the same missions um, formally merged under the leadership of President Ron Robbins, who Ron Robinson, who actually recently retired. Um, he served for over 40 years um, to help grow YAF up to what it is today. And, and now YAF is an organization that is multifaceted or faceted um, and uh, covers a lot of different areas. Uh, for example, Young Americans Freedom, as I mentioned, which is our right. activist arm. We train students actually now going into middle school and we're actually going to be working to help younger people through our new project called The Long Game, which I'm happy to touch on a little bit later. You can go to yaf.org slash long game to uh, get your free copy of YAF's uh, plan. But uh, we also have conferences all throughout the country, all throughout the year, uh, including at the Reagan Ranch, which we acquired in 1998, uh, right from the Reagans to preserve that legacy to make sure it wasn't developed. And it's pretty amazing. If, if you guys haven't been there, I strongly recommend you guys uh, make it out there and for everybody watching especially if you're a student I definitely want to get you guys out there we have conferences like i said throughout the year high school conferences uh, pretty regularly throughout the year and then college conferences you'll see at least every other year if not multiple times a year um, but it's pretty wild you go to the reagan ranch and it's left i quite literally how the reagans left it you can walk into their bedroom you see a zip it's pretty wild a bed zip tied together is because reagan was you know pretty humble. He grew up in Dixon, Illinois. Um, and you go into the closet, his boots are there. The clothes are still in the closet. Uh, but I digress. So we do conferences throughout the country. We own President Reagan's Ranch. We actually run the National Journalism Center, 
uh, which is arguably the best journalism program that you could get involved with. Um, we're actually now, I think, four weeks into the internship program here. What we do is we work to, uh, we recruit students and uh, we will identify strong, uh, promising students and place them at organizations within the media movement, whether it's Fox News, The Daily Caller, it could be print, could be TV, could be radio. Um, we place them at different uh, outlets four days out of the week. And on the fifth day, we bring them into our headquarters and we give them um, personalized training uh, from greats in the journalist, uh, journalism movement or journalism industry, excuse me. Um, we also have our Center for Entrepreneurship and Free Enterprise, which helps uh, equip students with uh, the ability to articulate uh, the value of free enterprise and its superiority over government control or socialism. Um, and one, actually, we partner with a lot of schools themselves, a lot of business schools, um, and it's a pretty cool experience. For we've had, like, at, I think it was a University of South Carolina, for example, they brought in um, CEO Steve Forbes to give a two-day lecture. So imagine being a student on campus and you have CEO Steve Forbes or Dr. Arthur Laffer, uh, the brain uh, child of the Laffer curve, um, teaching your class for a few days. Um, so we've got that program. And actually, our most recently uh, acquired project is the uh, Reagan Boyhood Home. Uh, just this past December, we acquired President Reagan's boy at home where he grew up in Dixon, Illinois. And we're going to be using that much like we use uh, the Reagan Ranch, but at the Reagan Ranch where you learn about Reagan the man and you learn about uh, how he operated. And you can really see that connection between his humility and faith as a man and translated as to president. In Dixon, you're going to learn about Reagan the boy and you're going to learn about all the values that he learned um, and, and was inspired by throughout the Midwest and how you'll see this beautiful direct translation between his childhood and how and why he was the man he was uh, out at the Reagan Ranch. Uh, and I actually will be headed up there next week, moving up there to help lead that effort um, and grow that project out there. But that is a kind of, so. I was gonna say that the boyhood home is kind of small, so you're gonna have to have pretty intimate meetings there, are you not? Well, it's uh, so the boy at home is not going to be the only place we meet. It's more Got so, for it. example, okay. the Reagan Ranch, we do programs at times up at the ranch, but a lot of it we have a Reagan Ranch Center, which is about 45 minutes down because the Reagan Ranch is way on top of a mountain. Okay. okay. Um, so, so that's how we'll operate with the boyhood home as well. You know, I was really interested in the journalism center because I know that's been, um, you know, Don and Don, Don Irvine, Action State Media, has really focused actually on to two halves of this, obviously accuracy of media, but the media piece and also academic uh, academia. But I was fascinated to look at the journalism program goes back like over 40 years, I guess. Mm -hmm. And some really distinguished authors going forward. I mean, Malcolm Gladwell and uh, John Fawn. I mean, John, but you could take they're both kind of two different directions, but both are, are, are fascinating to read for, how shall I say, different reasons. Uh, I mean, John Fawn has been really one of the leaders, thought leaders, um, his editorial page editor of the Wall Street Journal, really one of the, the thought leaders. He started, I guess, was it as an intern or was it a fellow or where, where was it? Uh, it was actually at the very beginning of the program. I won't put you on the spot on that. Yeah, I'd have to talk with our director of NJC. Yeah. But if I had a guess, he probably was in the internship program, just like everyone else. Um, another one that you guys probably love, you see him on Fox all the time, is Greg Gutfeld. Um, right. he, he was through that program. But uh, yeah, I can't stress enough how impressed I am with it. I don't have a direct involvement. I work with our YAF activists. Um, but I'm always proud of, of where our interns go off into. I, a lot of our interns, if they are graduated and they go through that program, they usually are picked right up by the places we, we put them at. Um, and it's, it's really cool to see all the work they do. I, I, in any given summer, we'll put out through our interns uh, thousands of different articles. Uh, and, and I think it's a really cool opportunity and experience for any student interested in journalism. Yeah, I believe Katie Pavlich is also one of your alums, right? Yes, sir. Peter Journalism Center and Peter Schweitzer. Mm -hmm. Great, great author. Both great people. Uh, I mean, you guys have done some phenomenal work. Because, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, we we're talking in the green room. You know, I've actually kind of went through this like a uh, similar thing. You know, I was 87 was the first CPAC I attended. And, you know, I've done Morton Blackwell's um, Media Leadership Training School, as well as I worked with Paul Weirich at NET. 
which I think there's a lot of crossover with uh, Young America's uh, National Journalism Post, who got their start there now. They're all over the place as well. And it's just fascinating. It's great that we're actually, it's great to hear conservatives are actually making inroads into, because I remember growing up, uh, my granddad would rail about 60 minutes and how Mike Wallace was a commie <laughs> and uh, Cronkite's a commie and how they like to, they framed Richard Nixon. And, um, mm -hmm. So it's great to see conservatives making it in. But, yeah. but, that, but that's really a, a key point, Dwight, I think, going forward, mm -hmm. which is that um, the problems that existed in the early 60s, the challenges of the institutions that were aligned against the conservative movement, they're still aligned to the conservative movement. Yeah. But the difference is that much more of a parallel infrastructure, obviously the think tank community uh, and now increasingly alternative, more con more balanced or conservative leaning media mm -hmm. uh, exists. Uh, and, and obviously young Americans, have, your organizations, both of them now together uh, have played a real role in, in mm -hmm. making that uh, happen. And it's really great to see, to be able to go back and take a look at people early in their career uh, having sort of those first steps, having a place at which uh, they can make their very first steps. Now you just, did you just recently had a program in Washington? Tell me what, tell me what people are doing these days. Who are they sure. seeing? Who are they talking to? Sure. So, I mean, as everyone in the world knows, it's been one heck of a year. Um, but uh, right now, thank the good Lord above, people are starting to wake up and get off their butts and start opening things back up. And we're able to start organizing in person, which we fortunately found ways to do all throughout uh, the, the shutdowns. Um, but, but now we're actually, you know, not have to limit ourselves to 50 people and, and stay, you know, 200 feet apart. Um, and as a matter of fact, we were just on Capitol Hill today um, for our annual Reagan forum. And we filled up the room with over 300 young people um, to uh, hear from um, some, um, some great experts um, and representatives on Reagan's legacy. And, and we really, I think, believe I wasn't there today, uh, but I, I think we talked more about the foreign policy, what was going on um, and, and how Reagan would approach uh, different uh, situations, for example, Russia. Um, and, uh, and how we'd approach that today. But uh, uh, that's what we just had going on in uh, Washington. I believe um, every week now we have something called the Buckley Breakfast, uh, which is for interns throughout the Washington area. Um, they're able to attend that program at our townhome. So a few years ago, we acquired a townhome actually right next door to the Heritage Foundation. Um, and one of my colleagues, Carol Lee Geis, is our Capital Hill Outreach Director. She she uh, lives there and she opens up her uh, home from time to time um, to host gatherings for young conservatives to be able to network um, and um, uh, learn from people like, for example, my boss, uh, CEO and, and Governor Scott Walker. He spoke last week. This uh, coming week, I believe tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken, and mistaking, Representative Jim Jordan, who uh, is going to be uh, leading along with Representative um, uh Kat, uh, she will, uh, they will be leading our uh, Campus Free Speech Caucus. Um, so I think you'll probably talk about that a little bit tomorrow. Um, and then coming up next week, we're going to be out in Santa Barbara, California for hopefully what will be the last of our day camp uh, sessions out there. California, as you know, is pretty terrible and had some awful regulations and made it very difficult for us to have programs out there. But we do recognize that there is a our conferences are, are very pivotal in a lot of young conservatives' lives. I know they were in my life, my life, um, and they're very inspirational. We don't want to uh, make it impossible for students to join. So we found a way to have programs out there. But what we had to do is they would end each day. Normally, we'll provide hotels, and, and the banquets will go on till 9 o'clock at night, and students will be able to network. Um, but I digress. Uh, we've got that going on next week out in Santa Barbara, California. Uh, we've actually got a couple – uh, camps going on at the end of next week and the beginning of the week after that. Um, and then going forward, we're going to have our National High School Leadership Conference, which traditionally is held in Maryland, the National 4-H Center. Again, Maryland's been pretty restrictive. Um, so we're hosting it at our headquarters this year uh, for high school students. And then uh, later on in July, we will have our um, program, our first ever program about American exceptionalism and Reagan's ideas and Dixon, Illinois at the Reagan Boyhood Home. So we're right. super excited um, to see how that goes. 
And then um, the, the big capstone program that we have every year, uh, normally in Washington, D.C., and we've, we've done it there since the 70s, is the National Conservative Student Conference, which for the first time ever, we've moved out of Washington, D.C., again, because it's ran by Comrade Bowser, um, to the free state of Texas. So we're hosting that in Houston, Texas, and we're going to have hundreds of students from all over the country, all over the world, uh, uh, probably. Uh, actually, I think we do have a few foreign students uh, joining us there, um, but that's going to be an amazing event. We've got some great speakers, headliners like uh, Vice President Pence and Lieutenant Colonel Alan West and Senator Ted Cruz. That list goes on, and I definitely encourage people to check that out. Um, but yeah, just uh, in a nutshell, that's kind of the stuff we've got going on this summer. So Kyle, tell us a little bit about what the process is for how people either sign up or do they do they have to get selected or how do students get get to participate in some of these programs? Sure. So it's pretty simple. Uh, if they just go to yaf.org slash events, they'll find our web page and they can see what programs they're interested in. And I definitely want to stress too, if you live, for example, in Maryland or Maine uh, and you see a program, whether it's in Virginia or in Texas or California, uh, if it's something that they're interested in, all they need to do is apply. And then actually, if any student looks at the FAQ section, they'll find information on how we can help with travel. Something, again, I, I mentioned earlier, we know students are full-time students. They, they uh, Sometimes uh, financing might be difficult. And we have a great supporter base and we do what we can to take care of the students and help them get to our programs. But uh, getting involved with YAF is very, very simple. Um, all they need to do is go to our webpage, whether it's, if it's a conference, you can go to our conference page. If it's a Young Americans Freedom you want to become a member of, um, they can join right at yaf.org. They'll see a button there. It's join YAF. Um, and then they just apply. And then what we do is that myself, a few colleagues, we'll go through the list of applicants, make sure they're not commies and plants. Um, and uh, once we verify that they're good to go and they say, hey, yeah, I'm, I love the Sharon statement. I'm going to promote that. I'm going to stay within that confines. Uh, we go ahead and accept them and bring them into our programs. Uh, we try to keep the barriers as low as possible. Yeah, because um, we want as many strong activists on campus as possible. So there really is it's sort of self-selection is sort of the main process is people need to take the initiative to get right. to figure out a program that is of interest to them and, uh, and find the time and, and come and participate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we will do. We love when if students call us and say, hey, I want to go to this program, but this is why I can't. It's great because then we can explain to them how they actually can and help them overcome it. But yeah, uh, like I said, we keep the barriers as low as possible. It's just a matter of students themselves um, endeavoring and um, being driven enough to uh, join one of our programs or join the app itself. So, Kyle, are individuals allowed to sponsor students that, let's say, one of the like we used to do this over at, when I was at ACU CPAC, where we had a lady in California that always bought like 100 CPAC tickets for students. You know, she'd sponsor 100 students to come back to CPAC and mm -hmm. she'd pay for the hotel and all that. So does uh, Young Americans have something similar where somebody could go and just give you, write you a check and then yeah. they get to send a bunch of kids? Absolutely, yeah, Dwight, thank you. And as a matter of fact, we, we love that because uh, usually when we have sponsor students, uh, those are the students who already have a supportive body behind them. And they're able to go back home and, and really start blossoming. They already have that foundation. Um, but if anybody's interested in sponsoring uh, students to our program, all they need to do is they can either reach out to me or just call 800-USA-1776. Um, and we have uh, various different staff members here who will help um, direct to how you would donate that money so that way it's for if you have a particular student in mind or or at some instances you might not have a particular student in mind but you know you want students from a particular location or you want to take care of students at a particular school we'll work to help uh, make sure your wishes uh, are uh, brought into fruition cool yeah, so, that so let's go back a little back in history i guess i'm i'm having a lot of fun with the history is 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 yeah was one of the co-founders of CPAC. It was. Now, I know it that was before your time. It so was. I'm not. Uh, I'm not. I'm not going to ask you any questions about like what the because this was in in the what was in the mid early 70s, right? I think it was 1974, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so this this really is it, it's a kind of a fascinating period because it was a uh, candidly it was kind of a dark dark year uh, for the conservative movement. And, uh, uh, and yet, you know, something, something came of it at the beginning of, of CPAC, which over the years has really blossomed into a, a sort of a really 
effective in networking uh, event, but also an event for, for various, how shall I say, the various flavors of conservatism uh, right. could, could, could be exposed and people could, could participate. Uh, but again, that that's a, another really great initiative that you guys were uh, uh, instrumental in starting. So now Scott Walker has taken over. Now, when when did he come over, and and, and how has how have things changed as a result of that? Well, uh, so he officially took over in February, but he's actually been engaged with us for quite some time as an ally, and then once. Um, uh, he was selected by our board to lead and take over in February. Uh, I, he's pretty much been in the office since well, about last summer. Um, he's been uh, working with us and, and, and really Ron mentored him along. Um, and, and what's nice too, uh, uh, maybe I'm biased because I work for it, but, but YAF does a lot of good work, I would say. Um, and so Governor Walker is not coming in so much to, or didn't come in so much to change yet, but really grow what we're doing. And that's what the long game is all about. It's a 12 point platform that that helps illustrate exactly how YAF is going to grow upon it. So whereas now YAF has um, contacts and students on over 2000 campuses, we're shy of the 4000 that exists in the country. And, and so and that's part of the long game. We want to be on 4000 campuses. Um, we we want to make sure that uh, our, our lectures are happening in every single state every year uh, that we're bringing in the best and brightest conservatives and putting them before students at the biggest schools. Um, and taking care of students all across the country. Uh, we also recognize that the left has not stopped in college. They haven't just stopped in high school. Uh, they're all the way down in a pre-K. I'm sure you guys are probably familiar with or may have heard about what was going on in Iowa. God bless that uh, legislator uh, for passing that uh, bill, and it's now a law that they kicked out um, critical theory off of their campuses. But I remember when it first came through our campus bias tip line, which is it, – it, really has been amazing what comes to that every day my my actually spokeswoman uh, she's right next to my office and she deals with it everything that anything that comes through yaf.org slash tips um she usually tells me about and, and she showed me ames iowa all the way down k through 12 uh there were what was it a uh, pre-k class teaching students uh, uh during black history month or actually it was a i think it was a black week of pride or something like that something bizarre but black lives matter helped them set that up and uh, they, it was a coloring book uh, full of transgender items. I don't know what that has to do with, with being black or black culture, uh, but that's what they were trying to ram down pre-K, four-year-old's throats. I don't know about you guys, but I certainly didn't care anything about gender at all at that age. Um, and, and there was some, some very appalling stuff that came through that. But as I was saying, through the long game, we're, we recognize that the left is certainly influencing those students. And so we are now developing strategies to make sure that we're taking care of students. We're taking care of their parents. And importantly, we're taking care of the educators, too. Um, our campus bias tip line has been pretty amazing. It started out as a resource for students to reach out to us. But, man, we're getting concerned. Parents, citizens, and a lot of educators. I can't tell you, ever since we've un unveiled this plan, I get about two a week, uh, whether they're college professors or they're high school teachers or they're faculty uh, members or advisors of different uh, organizations. Um, there, there are a lot of really good people. They may not necessarily be conservative, but they're certainly disgusted with this Marxist uh, wave that that seems to be sweeping a lot of schools. And they just want to make sure students are provided a, a fair and even playing field where they're actually able to express themselves without being ostracized, um, not just by their peers, but by the school themselves or schools itself. Um, uh, so, so the long game, we're we're really expanding uh, what we're doing to not just. You know, working with high school and college students, but but people far and wide uh, with a focus on students, obviously. But we want to teach students how they can help students because yeah, if, uh, as is you know influential as as we are, we we cannot do it by ourselves. We're we're actually a pretty small organization. We need a lot of community support around it. And so the long game, uh, through the long game, we're developing those strategies to help communities, help young people. Because you know, as Reagan said, uh, freedom's not passed along the bloodstream. Uh, you've got to fight for it, and it's more than it's never more than one generation away from extinction. So you mentioned at the outset that you were beginning a program, high schools and middle schools, or I think you were moving to middle schools. Tell me a little bit about what you're doing there. Sure. Uh, so right now uh, we've expanded our membership program, which we just unveiled last September, and it's taken off. We've got thousands and thousands of member, uh, or thousands thousands of members. 
Uh, we have expanded that to middle school. As I mentioned, okay. YAF traditionally has been high school and colleges. Um, so we've expanded that to middle school. And through that program, we're helping provide those students with activism resources that they can carry out themselves, but also can partner with their peers um, to uh, carry out projects. For example, one of my colleagues, Madison Habersetzer and Claire Hinshaw here, uh, put together a pretty awesome program um, called the uh, Pro-Life Timeline. And it's pretty amazing. Uh, what it is, is it's a series of posters that students will hang on a wall that's prominent on, on campus. They'll take those little uh, page marker sticky notes and they'll table and ask students, hey, where do you think life begins? And there's different stages and it, it provides a little description of, hey, this is what's going on. You know, heart develops at this period of time. Um, students start, or kids start kicking at this age uh, or at this stage in development. So they'll, they'll place a note where they think life begins. And then wherever they put that note, they will be given an index card that explains exactly what the abortion process looks like up into that point. And it really makes students think critically. And we did it for the first time ever this year. We got a lot of positive feedback and it was pretty interesting to hear from students. So once they handed out those index cards and, and kids started looking at uh, exactly what happens at that stage during an abortion, they go, oh, can I can I move that sticky note? I, I you know, this, this sounds a lot more like a life than I thought it was. Uh, but anyhow, uh, that's what we're doing with middle school students. And like I said, we're still developing strategies too uh, we're we're uh, working with a lot of um, teachers in particular uh, to to help figure out how they can provide resources to their classroom. And one thing we're really excited about too, we own those two presidential properties, Reagan's Ranch and his boyhood home. And we're going to be using that as a resource too to help inspire young people, um, whether they're field trips. We've also really started expanding because of COVID. It kind of challenged us and it's we've gotten a lot of positive feedback. So we're going to continue to do it, but virtual tours, virtual programs, um, so we're going to figure out how to package that so that way teachers uh, can start using that and we'll do it in a way that teachers don't have to feel like they're going to get screamed at by angry parents by saying, oh, you're trying to push them towards a Republican president, but uh, rather so that way students can understand what it means to be an American, what America's founding ideas were and how that inspired one of the most influential uh, humans in the past century um, to really save you know millions and millions of people out in, in the Soviet Union and brought down uh, the Soviet Union and the Berlin Wall. Um, but we'll be pack packaging that and, and that actually will probably be used more through, um, you know, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, fifth grade, uh, fourth grade, that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, that's that's what we're in the works now. Good, let's go back to the tip line. And, sure. and you, you said you're regularly getting some, I, I, I'm assuming that you're probably getting more uh, responses these days since there seems to be a, an explosion of awareness of the curriculum issues mm -hmm. around critical race theory. Um, and it, it seems to become, uh, uh, let me just throw it out, kind of a, a rallying cry as yeah. parents and students and also many teachers are sort of pushing back on what has been, what has become a it's actually been around for quite a while within academia, but oh, because yeah. it's it's been it's moving into the high schools as away from the universities, um, it's gotten much more uh, much more exposure, and there's much more awareness of that. Um, is that some? I assume that's something you're getting a lot of uh, tips on. What that's what happens absolutely. with those tips? What happens to all of those? So our, our spokeswoman, and we're actually hiring somebody else to help us keep up with this um, uh, through our new guard, um, but um, she covers these stories. She puts them out there. Uh, we've got connections. You know, like I mentioned, what's been beautiful about NJC, it's, it's made it easier for us to, excuse me, um, interact with these uh, different media outlets, but we'll work with different media outlets to publicize this stuff. Um, and actually, yeah, I would, I would say uh, this tip line has been pretty, I think, instrumental in helping raise awareness of what's going on. I remember, I don't, was it uh, March perhaps, or, or maybe April, we had a mother reach out to us through the tip tip line. And, and she said, hey, I have this screen recording. I went to our, and it was through Zoom at this time, um, through our um, school board meeting. And uh, I, I stood up against this critical uh, race uh, training that they were trying to force on teachers um, and, and push down to students. And it was pretty amazing um, because the video, we took that video, we wrote a small blurb on it and we put it out there and it went off like wildfire. Uh, it was pretty impressive. The, the conservative movement uh, really was inspired to see other people stand up, speak out. 
And, and uh, you know, ever since then, we've been seeing it, as you guys probably, you know, kept up with what's going on in Loudoun County. Um, just this past a couple of weeks, they tried to boot a PE teacher who said, no, I'm going to refer to people by their, you know, chromosomes and, and by their, their actual pronouns. Uh, and schools try to boot them. And, and thank God a court came in and said, no, you, you can't do that. Um, and a lot of uh, parents, kids, family members uh, have been going to those uh, school board meetings to uh, stand out and speak out against that. Um, but to go back to the campus bias tip line, that video, which if you see that video, there's not a lot going on to it. If there's no audio, it's a pretty boring item. You really only see the school board itself, which they're all about 12 feet apart. And they look like little raisins on the screen. You just see little dots. Um, that, that are people's heads and you can't really, you know, tell who's who and what's going on. Um, but you hear the mother speaking out and, and she really chastises the school board who's, again, trying to push this critical theory um, down to uh, students and teachers saying, you know, I, I'm Latina. My kids are Latino. Never once have they felt belittled because of their race. But you're trying to tell them that they're lesser and that they're going to have a harder life and that they're never going to be good enough um, to get things. And therefore, they have to look to the government for help. Um, and, and that her speaking out ended up inspiring one of the school board members to speak out and say, yeah, she's right. This is terrible. We shouldn't do this. Um, and, and all you see is a little raisin moving. Like you see a dot, uh, it's a little head moving on the screen. And, and I, when I first saw it, I thought, well, it's going to be great to, you know, share this, but I'm not sure this video is really going to get anything because there's, you don't see anything going on. And it went wild, um, uh, because a lot of people, they're not even conservatives, just decent Americans who may not be that ideological are sick of this. I mean, it, it's it's pretty evil. It really is. Uh, as Governor Walker talks about, it's state sponsored racism is what it is. And and uh, I thank God a lot of communities are saying enough is enough. Um, but we, we've been getting a lot of that. As a matter of fact, just yesterday, I got something. Uh, we got to figure out a way to help her um, or him out. Uh, from a uh, school up in uh, Cleveland, a university. There is a professor there who uh, she sees what's going on at her school. Again, this critical theory stuff is being pushed around and, and she wants to help us uh, combat it. Uh, but there are a lot of professors uh, and that's what's been really cool. A lot of professors who say, hey, this exists on my campus. It's not good. And unfortunately, it's too popular. Uh, but, but we want to uh, help suppress this and, and certainly raise awareness of what's going on. Um, and show show what's being taught to students. Um, and so uh, the, most of the stuff ends up being stories when it's it provides documents or videos and stuff like that, but also it's helping us compile context. Um, so so when we start providing those resources to these people, we can start building a coalitions of um, professors and teachers and uh, uh, concerned citizens to push this crap. It's interesting because one of the, the underpinnings of it is, is so fundamentally uh, at odds with the spirit of Ronald Reagan, the oh, idea of, of an individual, of what an individual can accomplish, and judging a person by their own merit. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it really reflects a, almost a sea change um, that uh, ideas that w we thought had been, um, how shall I say, um, it's like a whack-a-mole. It's something, right. you know, basically a set of ideas that you know um, are returning uh, I love the phrase that you mentioned, uh, state-sponsored uh, racism, because it does strike me that if if some of the same assumptions about people were coming from somebody else, uh, they would immediately get challenged. But because, quote, these are woke or uh, uh, people who are, uh, you know, have trying to virtue signal, uh, somehow it becomes more, it, more plausible it, or more yeah. acceptable. It, it truly is the wildest thing. I remember in high school, in my civics course, learning about Brown versus Board of Education, which, you know, um, said that separate but equal is not equal. And and I remember learning about that case and, and learning about what was going on prior to that and hearing something that sounds eerily familiar to what schools are pushing today. And that's, well, we should separate people based on the color of their skin because, you know, they just won't be comfortable around one another. They'll feel unsafe. And, and if we want people to really prosper, we should give them their own um, their own space. And, and we can make it equal, but we, we got to give them their own space. And today, you know, safe spaces. And it's it's I see it today on college campuses. The campus bias tip line. We've 
thank God, been able to combat it. I know there are a few schools in Florida, some in Virginia, that said, hey, we're going to create segregated housing because that makes people feel safer. And we just thought, oh, my gosh, we've seen this before. And this, is, this is terrible. This is, this is antithetical to what it means to be an American. And you're absolutely right. Um, critical theory in and of itself, uh, it's pretty wild. Uh, Karl Marx, his ideas, you, you left loves to say to people like, yeah, because in our sharing statement, we say that communism today is and continues to be the greatest threat. And we still stand by that. That was written in 1960, and that was no less true today than it was then. Um, Karl Marx is really the father of critical theory, which was brought into the United States and, and started taking root at Harvard in the 60s uh, through critical legal studies. Um, and then in 19, I think 1970s, they, they Americanized it through race, critical race theory um, into it. Uh, and and it, it's, it's been creeping and, and it seems to be reaching ahead here. Uh, and, and people, thank God, are starting to learn more about what it is. But it, essentially what it does, critical theory, they just, you, you bastardize whatever it is, the principles that you're trying to combat. And in, in essence, they're trying to destroy what it means to be in America. And that's individual freedom, free enterprise, strong national defense, um, uh, and traditional American values. They're, they're cutting all of that, which, which if anybody actually takes the time to look at that, and, and we find it all the time, you know, when we go to campuses and we can go to a leftist camp and say, hey, I'm a conservative. And immediately a leftist will think, oh, you're racist, homophobic, baby, and xenophobe, da, 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 da. But if we actually say, well, here's the ideas we believe in, they start going, oh, yeah, I agree with that. That's what I like. And you're like, yeah, you're probably more conservative than you recognize. Um, but, but the ideas that America was founded on very much are meant to unite people, not separate them. And the left today says, oh, well, hey, you're from this country. Well, you, you probably need a special assistance here. You, you're going to find it harder. Oh, you have this color skin. You're going to have a harder life. Uh, or, you know, in cases like Harvard, um, you're Asian. So we're going to we're going to make it harder on you to get into this school because we've got to try to you know, level the playing field, which is, there's nothing level about looking at somebody. How many times have, have, you know, us as young people learned, oh, don't judge a book by their cover. And at the same time, that's exactly the left's, uh, that, that's what they do. Uh, they look at somebody and they say, I know exactly your, your life's background. I know what you're going to be worth going forward. And, and you should probably come to me, um, the one who knows all, so that way I can make your life happy and really give you a true purpose, which it's, it's a complete bastardization of what it means to be an American. America... Yeah, I was going to say, and even worse is the expectation that the folks who who fit a particular yeah. profile and, and think, are supposed uh, to think a, yeah. a particular way. Right. And yeah. Mark, and I think Bush said it best: it's the bigotry of low expectation, you know, the soft bigotry, and that's pretty much what it is. Oh, you're not smart enough as the white and Asian kid, so we're going to put you here, mm -hmm. or you know, it's, you know, well, it's not that you're not smart enough, but that somehow because of racism, yeah, you won't be exactly. able to compete. So therefore you need some special. Yeah. It robs people of their dignity. It really does. Mm -hmm. it, it, and it is really frustrating too. You see um, through this, it's the government and these, um, whether it's the government or schools, which essentially um, heavily funded by government, even if they're private, uh, trying to tell students um, they have to go to the, the bureaucrats, the government, um, to find their purpose. And, and, and it's, again, you know, the United States uh, was founded so that way people would have the freedom to actualize their purpose because they knew they, they could look to God to find their purpose. And, and rather critical theory is just trying to totally replace that because, um, you know, as you mentioned, racism, it's, it's just the, the set up by white men to be racist. And, you know, I think the ideas that America was founded on were from people who weren't white at all, who were from uh, probably much darker skin and certainly more much darker skin um, somewhere in the, the Near East, um, but I digress, getting on a little tangent there. Uh, it was just very frustrating. I, I hate critical theory. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, you have no arguments in it from us. But, it, but it's great because I think that it's an exam that great in the sense that it has highlighted uh, some of the extreme nature of uh, where sort of academic things that they are taking for granted these days uh, are so contrary to the common sense of average Americans that uh, you get the natural pushback. So um, tell us a little bit more. We, we kind of talked about the selection process, the self-selection. Uh, mm -hmm. What are some of the opportunities that folks can, additional ways that they can get involved? 
Sure. So if you're a student, I'd certainly say the easiest way to get involved, uh, and, and we were really excited about this, I mentioned it earlier, is our membership program. Um, there is no buy-in on your part other than subscribing to the sharing statement. So if you're not a conservative, keep walking. Uh, we don't want you. But if, if you, you, you want to stand for America and you want to help push back on your campus and your communities, um, become a YAF activist. It doesn't cost you anything. All you need to do is go to our website, fill out a form. We'll go ahead and take care of you. We'll send you a membership card, send you a T-shirt. It gives you exclusive access to programs, whether they're in person, at our conferences, or they're virtual. Um, I, we also men mentioned our conferences. Those are great ways to get involved. We've got internship programs uh, that we have going on uh, all throughout the year. Um, and then if you're a community member, um, I certainly recommend you go to yaf.org slash long game. And you can learn all about our, our um, strategy going forward um, with the foundation and how you can get involved more specifically. Um, there are more ways to get involved with the Young America's Foundation nonprofits than, than just donating. Um, you, you can get involved. Uh, if you know young people, certainly send them our way. Uh, I'll tell you what, um, as somebody who the executive director of Young America's Freedom, I work with our YAF, YAF activists every day, all day, all across the country. Our strongest activists are those that have a support body around them. Uh, students oftentimes, whether even if they're in conservative communities, oftentimes feel like they're alone. And to know that there's somebody who's in the arena with them, who's supporting them, because you know, you probably see this. It doesn't take long, just watch TV, and you'll see people who should be on the same side, who will say they're conservatives, go at each other's throat all the time. Um, and it even happens amongst young people. There, It's very easy to criticize people and say, oh, well, you're being too controversial, or you're not going far enough. But to, to find young people in your community to say, hey, I'm with you. I, re I recognize what you're going through on campus. I want to make sure that I can support you. That goes a huge, huge, and at a very long way. It does a lot for a young person, and that's really what keeps them motivated. Our strongest YAF chapters, in particular, our strongest high school YAF chapters, um, our strongest activists are those that have uh, engaged parents, engaged community members um, who are there to help. Uh, you know, open, whether you know, for example, it was beautiful during COVID. Schools wouldn't let them meet on campus. There were individuals said, "Hey, I'll open up my restaurant. I'll open up my shop. I'll give you a place to meet." That kind of thing goes a long way for young people. Sounds like a great idea. Well, thank you very much, and and it's it's great to hear from you and and learn about what you're doing, and uh, it's great to hear how y Young Americans for Freedom is really, how shall I say, continue to live up to the the spirit of that Sharon uh, Sharon statement so many years ago, and has found new and creative ways to be able to engage um, follow-on generations and uh, get them involved in the political arena. So. Thank you for that. And uh, we'll also encourage people to take Dwight's advice. And you know, how many was it you were, wanted to sponsor 100 or so people? Yeah, I mean, I've, you know, I actually have done that for um, other, uh, like people who want to go to leadership and see classes, I've actually paid for 100 uh, memberships. I think one of the things, you know, just like, yeah, they do great trainings. And uh, I think, you know, going to those, uh, Trains was worth a four-year education. Actually, at least, especially the campaign leadership school they have, I think is really great. I think going to the Reagan Ranch, spending, what is it, I think it's a week long at the Reagan Ranch you guys have? Typically, yes, sir. Yeah, and that's also worth a four-year education. You know, it's cheap, a lot cheaper than sending your kid to any state school or any Ivy League school for that matter, or a fraction of that, you know. One thing we say about NCSC is in the week, five days at NCSC, you'll hear from more conservatives um, and in solid pro-American education than you'll hear in your four years in college. The, yeah. the sad thing about it is how true that is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, thank you very much. It's been great having you on the show. Well, Mark and Dwight, thank you very much for having me on Direct Line. I really enjoyed this. Awesome. We'd love to have you back. <laughs>